based on um, taking the world, which is very complicated, and making simpler versions of it, right? So, um, yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll get into that in, in a bit. Um, that has obvious it has advantages, which is you can analyze things better. It has downsides, which is um, worlds don't have just two things in them; they have lots of things in them. Um, so you're simplifying um, and losing some things there, but uh, we'll we'll get into it. Um, what this is not about, right? I just don't have enough time to to get into an argument about these. Um, I mean, there are probably going to be some biases in this talk just because I'm a human and I have biases, but I'm not trying to like make this an argument about whether there should be unions or a minimum wage or anything. Like, not to say that those arguments aren't fascinating. They're really fascinating. Um, the research about them is really interesting. Um, there's a lot of really good debate going on about this right now because uh, we're in the middle of a presidential primary race. Um, it's just not, this is, I'm trying to stay away from all that stuff um because the talk is too short um we are going to talk about one thing though which is productivity right this is a pretty core concept in economics um so what is productivity right it's going to be core to this paper as well um how many people does it take to do stuff right how much does it cost to do stuff how much space does it take um in order to build widgets right um how yeah so any of these things right like we can measure Kind of how long it takes and and we can improve it over time right that's the goal of most people in most things right if i can find a way to wash the dishes faster i can spend more time uh doing other stuff that i like better right um so an example of productivity is computing right which in the early days actually meant like human computing right which was uh this is an example from nasa right which you might have seen in the movie hidden figures recently where if they needed to calculate the trajectory of some uh celestial body they would literally ask people to go and make those calculations and do that right and then they have to go and check them um, this is obviously very slow uh, error prone um, and you can do it a lot faster and a lot better with a TI-83 now right um, or whatever probably TI-87 I don't know that was in school in 2006 so uh, whatever it is now um, so that's an example of a productivity increase right it used to take a room full of people all day to make these calculations and now we can do them uh, in an order of seconds, right? Um, another example of farming, right? So in 1800, five out of every six people uh, was a farmer, right? So uh, five in every six people was, had to farm in order to provide enough food for everyone to eat, right? And, and sustain themselves, right? So that means you only had one out of every six people could do something else like anything else. Right, um, and now, well, 2010 is what I guess that's for. Uh, one and a half percent of people are farmers, right? So a lot more people can do other stuff. Um, so that's an example of a, a productivity increase, right? We don't need to have five out of every six people in this room uh, collecting potatoes or whatever, right? Uh, is that bad? Um, it depends, right? I mean, if you go from 83% of the economy to one and a half percent, people might lose their jobs, um, people might lose prestige. Um, certainly it's going to mean a lot of uh, different things for the economy, right? Um, I just want to talk through really fast, like how that happens, right? I mean, like all the people that are calculators, right? Like no one's a human calculator anymore, right? Like, um, how does that kind of change happen, right? Um, sometimes it's through layoffs. Um, we tell people you used to have a job and now you don't have a job. Um, that's not that great. Um, there are some retraining programs that are not that effective. Uh, at least that's the evidence. Um, they don't really work that well, um, but those programs do exist. Um, but there are other ways that uh, sectoral shifts happen, right? Um, so if a farmer grows old and retires, um, and someone enters the workforce and leaves the workforce when you retire, and someone else enters the workforce, but in a different industry, right? That's one way that kind of economies can shift over time, right? Um, in other ways, we have more people now, right? So maybe the number of farmers is the same in 1800 as it is now, but because we have so many pe more people in the country and the planet, um, all of the new people are doing other things, right? Um, and so that way people aren't losing their jobs, um, but you're able to kind of grow the economy, right? Um, or people move to adjacent industries, right? So you have to get your stuff from your farm to the market or whatever. Um, maybe you get really good at that and then you launch a transportation business or something like that, right? Um, this is another common uh, way that uh, people change jobs, kind of grow when, when an economy changes and something becomes uh, productivity changes mean people kind of lose. 
Uh, other productivity increases examples. So it used to be really expensive to fly across the country or ship something across the country and really slow. Now it's really fast. Um, you used to have to go to a data center to rack a server and rent space in advance. And now you can go to AWS and in three clicks, you can have a Ruby on Rails app uh, up and running. Um, consumer electronics, obviously, um, have always gotten smaller and cheaper over time. Manufacturing in general um, gets more productive over time, right? Um, these are industries that are becoming more productive where you can kind of expect that to happen, right? So the, the focus of this paper is on industries where productivity does not increase. Um, and so that's what William Baumol and William Bowen were looking at in 1965 when they wrote this paper. Um, Baumol is kind of the more famous one. Uh, he just spent more time working on this problem. Um, this is the first paper that came out, so it tends to be the one that gets cited a lot. Um, but he really dedicated kind of the next few decades to working on this, so he wrote a lot of papers about it. Um, but this one in particular is about uh, the performing arts, right? So it's basically like, why do artists starve, right? Like, why is it that, uh, why is it that, it doesn't have to be the case that uh, most actors and singers and dancers don't make a lot of money, right? Like, why is it the case that they don't make a lot of money? The generally conditions are, are, are bad and, uh, uh, you know, we all have this notion in our heads. I don't need to explain this to you. Um, so the first part of the paper is very conventional, right? Nonprofits have goals besides making money. Um, if you are building, I don't know, a car, you have some level of quality that when you hit it, uh, you sell the, you say that's good enough and you, you sell the car, right? For hopefully less, more, hopefully you sell it for more than you made it and you make some money, right? Nonprofits have goals besides that, right? If you're a nonprofit and you're building affordable housing, you want to maximize the amount of affordable housing that you build, right? Or if you want to bring culture to people, you want to maximize the amount of culture that you bring to people, right? So if you get more money in the door, if you raise more money, you're going to spend it by building more homes, uh, building more, or adding more shows or whatever you're doing, right? So. That's, that's pretty obvious, right? Um, that's a very conventional part of the paper. Uh, yeah, as they go, the objectives of a nonprofit by their very nature keep it on the brink of financial catastrophe, right? Like if you're not spending all of the money you have, you're probably not uh, maximizing your objective, which is not to make money, it's to give people uh, something beneficial to their lives. Uh, the second part of the paper is a lot more depressing. Um, basically it's like everything's gonna get more expensive and you can't really do much about it, right? Um, and not just more expensive in the way that like you see things that are like a subway ticket used to cost 20 cents and now it's three dollars right like more expensive in the sense that like even relative to everything else the arts are going to get more and more and more expensive relative to those other things right so it's not just inflation it's inflation plus every single year they're going to get more expensive relative to everything else so this is why it goes into explaining in the papers why that is the case Right, um, and the reason this is such a powerful insight, insight is there are lots of parts of our economy that kind of have the same model, right? Um, so there's one kind of assumption or observation, depending on how you want to think about it, which is wages rise as productivity increases, right? Um, and this is kind of difficult to get your head around. I'm gonna to try to explain it as best as I can. Um, this is generally true um, in that the economy as a whole has become more productive. If you think about how much people can do um, and wages have also risen, right? In real terms, not just in uh, nominal terms, right? Um, if people know the difference between real and nominal. It's like, you can buy more stuff with, with the money that you have, right? Um, not just like, uh, things are more expensive, right? But you can still buy more of it, right? So um, in real terms, wages are higher, but uh, let's go into this more. So uh, this is one way to think about a salary. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, this is one way to think about how to determine a wage or a salary. It's not the only way, it's one way. How much does a company have to pay so workers don't take the other jobs, right? Um, we need people to choose our company over every other company that they could possibly work at, right? So we need to pay enough for them to do that, right? That's one way to think about a wage, right? Um, broadly, it's, it's true, right? If you think about, you know, you're gonna choose, when you're choosing where, where to work, uh, you're thinking about it in kind of the same, um, you know, and wage isn't the only, obviously it's not the only factor that people consider when they choose a job, but it's the primary, it's one of the primary ones, right? Um, broadly speaking, um, for most jobs. Um, and so how does that change? Uh, how does wage change when productivity increases, right? So 
let's say, again, this is how we do economics is we make up a hypothetical example. Um, so let's say we have 10 people and they can make two cars per day right, in this sample factory that I've made. And based on that, we can get $1,000 per worker per day, right? This is a completely fabricated example. And then now let's say we have some productivity improvement, right? With an assembly line or uh, something, we teach people how to work better or we implement um, better factory practices so people can make four cars per day. Right now we can make $2,000 per person per day, right? Um, so what does that mean for wages, right? Uh, you'd be willing to pay more for workers, right? In the first case, if, you, if a worker demanded $1,500 per day, in the first case you'd say, well, no, I wouldn't make any cars, so I'd rather not make the cars and not $100 uh, per person per day, right? But in the second case, you still pay per day, right? So you say, great, come on into the factory, um, let's make, Let's make more money, right? Um, generally, so yeah, so this is generally like an example of how like productivity increases can uh, lead to increased wages, right? In the second example, if you have a high revenue per worker, uh, you're willing to pay more um, for people to come and work in your factory, right? If you can pay more and get more people to work for you, you can make more widgets and you can make more um, revenue. So what happens to wages and prices, right? So the productivity increase leads to a wage increase. Not always, that's what the asterisk was there in the this slide. Most of the time it leads to a wage increase. Um, what happens to the car price? The car price stays the same, right? So we, can make, um, um, we can keep the car price. Um, so the story, for example, for like iPhones, right? Making the iPhones in China, not making a lot, they're making more iPhones, other kinds of phones are all still cheaper. Manufacturing productivity is increasing, right? That's how we can have the situation where Wages can increase, but prices can drop, right? Yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll, get, we'll get into that, yeah. Um, so if Acme Co pays more, what happens to the other companies, right? Maybe the other companies don't have a productivity increase. What happens to them, right? Well, I would say, uh, what has anyone here tried to uh, hire someone who has said, no, well, uh, and then lost that hiring fight because Google or Netflix or Facebook or whoever was willing to pay them more money, like back up the dump truck uh, and, and pay them more money, right? Um, maybe I'll work for Google, Netflix or Facebook. All right. Um, so, I mean, so even, so even at the other companies, even if they're not becoming more productive and getting these productivity increases, they might still have to pay more for workers anyway. Right, just because Acme Co gets more effective, they're willing to bid up the price so everyone else has to pay more to hire people to work at the same companies. Um, so Baumol looked at what happens at nonprofits specifically um, because productivity in the performing arts is not increasing, right? Uh, if we think about most string quartet 22, sorry, oh no, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, how long did it take to perform this in 19, in 1800? Does anyone know any pianist here or uh, cellist or violinist? About 24 minutes. How long did it take to perform Mozart's String Quartet number 22 in 2019? 24 minutes, right? And how many people do you need to perform a string quartet? Four, right? You need the same amount in 1800 and 2019, right? There's no productivity increase. This is not an area that is ripe for disruption, right? No one is going to be disrupting the Mozart string quartet. There's no way that you can do this with, with fewer people or faster or anything. It's just, this is not possible, right? Robot violence, that's true, yes. You could have uh, robots. So, yeah, so, I mean, they wrote about this in the paper, right? They said, uh, it is fairly difficult to reduce the number of actors in Henry IV part two, right? You need some number of people to do all the speaking parts uh, in the role. Um, so, yeah, so, in that case, we can't even if we can't really make everyone more productive, right? So we can't offset a wage increase by uh, making everyone do kind of more and producing the same amount or keeping prices the same. So a wage increase leads to a cost increase, right? Um, this means uh, if it costs more to pay everyone to perform the play or, or dance or uh, perform the string quartet, that's going to lead to an increase in the amount of cost it takes to put on the production, right? 
Um, you might be saying, well, artists have never made as much as bankers, right? I mean, it's always kind of been, there's always kind of been a wage differential, right? But even though there's been a wage differential, they said, well, there's kind of a limit to the financial sacrifice. That is to say, uh, maybe you derive some benefit from being an artist and you get to go on stage and perform and you're willing to accept some uh, financial discount to do that, but there's a limit to that, right? Um, if it becomes too incentivizing to go take another job, you might do that, right? And so in that sense, nonprofits still have to keep paying more and more and raising the prices that they're paying their actors and paying their dancers, even if uh, like their, their business isn't changing, right? Even if they're putting on the same shows and the same things because other things are changing in the economy um, and wages are rising elsewhere, they still have to pay more out, right? And that leads to cost increases. And it's not just nonprofits, right? Uh, there's a lot of the economy that kind of resembles this, right? Um, getting a haircut takes generally the same amount of time as it took in 1950. Diagnosing an illness, you still need to ask someone to label their symptoms and uh, hit their knee, so see if it bends and everything like that, right? An hour-long massage still takes an hour, and it did 100 years ago. Um, teaching first grade takes the same amount of time as it did 100 years ago, right? You still have to have someone in a room teaching first grade, right? So all these kind of jobs are going to be dominated by the labor cost, right? And so if the labor cost increases, the cost of providing the service increases, right? Um, the cost of paying for the service increases because um, you can't there's no way there's no real way to make these things more productive right i mean you can we're, we'll, we'll talk about that right but generally speaking an hour-long massage is going to require someone to work on uh, your back for an hour right there's no there's no way around that right? um so yeah so how much do you have to pay a, a barber actor teacher to not make cars right um you still have to pay them right so it's their best option um so you so if uh, people are willing to pay more. If car manufacturers are willing to pay more, um, you have to raise your prices as well. You have to raise your wages as well. Um, so what happens is a simplified economy, right? So if productivity increases and the barber says, well, you need to pay me more, I'm gonna go make cars or do something else with my life instead of cut hair, uh, the barber needs to raise, right? Um, so the cost of a haircut is gonna increase by the same amount because the barber can't see more people in a day uh, the barber still has, you know, eight clients a day or whatever, right? And that's the same as it was 20 years ago. So if they need to raise, they need to raise the price of haircuts, right? Um, the haircut cost goes up. Um, and for example, like if electronics costs are going down, um, that means, oh, I'm not doing this right. I'm so sorry. Um, that means haircuts are going to be a bigger and bigger share of the economy, right? Now, haircuts are not that big a share of the economy, right? So this isn't that big of an example, but... Um, there are a lot of industries that are kind of like this, right? Like education, healthcare, performing arts, service industries more generally, right? That kind of fit these characteristics where um, the costs are going up, right? They're dominated by labor costs. The costs are going up as a share of the economy relative to everything else, right? Um, this is not really intuitive, right? We tend to think of things as getting more productive over time, right? We tend to think if you're providing the same thing, we can figure out how to make it cheaper or better over time. But there are some things that are just not ever gonna get cheaper, right? Um, they're just gonna cost more because you're gonna have to pay more to, for a person to provide the service for you, right? Um, this is Dalmal's insight and it's kind of depressing in a sense, right? Um, that's why this is known as the cost disease it's because the cost is just gonna go up and up and up and up, right? There's no real uh, solution there as long as uh, productivity is increasing somewhere in the economy and wages are increasing. Um, if some industries are not able to increase productivity then their costs are going to increase, right? Um, Raleigh speaking, education fits that, healthcare fits that. Not to say there are other, there aren't other costs, right? There are other things that are leading to increases in costs in education and healthcare. I'm happy to talk with you about them. Um, and again, we can talk about which is the primary driver, but this is one of the drivers, right? Is that you need to pay someone to sit in a classroom with 30 kindergartners and um, the opportunity cost of that person, um, if they have better options outside, you need to pay them more to teach kindergarten and so then the cost of providing education is going up right and if appliances cost is going down and the cost of cars is going down and the cost of phones is going down that means as a share of the economy education is going to get larger and larger right so 1993 he wrote this paper where he basically kind of made a projection of where these things were going to be uh, this is the 1990 uh, shares of the economy right education is about 10 percent healthcare is about 10 percent and he's projecting out to 2040 and he says, well, uh, this is where I think things are gonna be in 2040, right? And this is kind of tracked pretty well to where we 
are headed um, in terms of shares of the economy, right? Um, manufacturing and agriculture have gotten more efficient. Um, and use that to lower prices. Um, education and healthcare are dominated by labor cost. And so the share of the economy that we're spending on them is increasing, right? And the costs are increasing. Okay, are these things just gonna be expensive forever? Or are we totally screwed? How am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. Um, there are productivity improvements, right? There are productivity improvements in adjacent areas, right? So uh, Mozart String Quartet, if I'm Mozart and I wanna to travel to Frankfurt to put on a concert, they used to take six days, uh, and now it takes four hours, right? So um, there are other ways I can be more productive, right? Maybe it's, uh, we can rent out a space more efficiently or we can get people in and out, right? Um, we have iPods or iPhones now, right? So we can, someone somewhere can make a recording of Mozart and uh, everyone can listen to it, right? So that's an example of a productivity increase. Um, but I mean, the cost of a live show is still gonna be expensive and, and rising, right? Uh, if we are getting richer, we can spend more on things where the costs are increasing without cutting back on anything else, right? Um, so if the economy is growing and all of us have more money in our wallets every year, we can choose to take that extra money and spend it on the things that are getting more expensive. We don't need to cut back on anything else. Um, so then, I mean, it's, it's kind of bad that they're getting more expensive, but if we're all richer, it doesn't really matter too much, right? Um, there's bad news if we're not getting richer, right? So like a GDP growth of 3% doesn't mean all of us automatically just multiply the money in our bank accounts by 3%, right? Like some people get 50% and some people get zero and some people get negative percent, right? Um, so it's not good, right? If, if some people aren't getting richer and things are getting more expensive, that's, that's not good. Um, in the US and Europe, um, government is a big spender and provider of healthcare and education. It's not a, tended to be a, a statement about whether that's good or bad. It's just, it is, right? Like there are state universities and state education and there's Medicaid and Medicare and all this stuff, right? So if the costs of these things are increasing and they're taking a larger share of the economy and government is still involved in providing all these services, government spending will be a larger percentage of the economy, right? Um, again, I'm not trying to make a statement about whether it's good or bad. It's just, that's just mathematical uh, identity. Um, how many of you know who this is? Who is it? Prop 13 guy, yes. Does anyone know his name? Howard Jarvis, yeah. So, uh, so in the 1970s, um, California generally pays for university education by charging property taxes, right? So if you own a house, um, California will take like 1% of the value or 2% of the value um, every year in taxes. And you have to pay that to the government and then they use that to pay for education, right? It used to be free to attend UC Berkeley, UCLA, um, and property taxes were rising. And this guy said, well, I'm tired of paying more taxes. So uh, they passed a ballot measure that capped the rise of property taxes at 2% per year, right? So uh, if you buy a house and it doubles in value, um, you still only would pay like 2% increases each year, right? So you end up with a situation where you're paying taxes on something that's a lot less than the value of your house, right? Um, and this could be a problem if education and healthcare costs are rising faster than 2% a year, which they have been, right? Eventually these things are gonna uh, run into tension with each other, right? Um, so yeah, so tax increases are contentious, right? If, if government is spending more and more as part of the economy, um, that needs to be paid for with taxes now or later. Um, if tax increases are contentious, eventually these things are gonna clash at some point, right? Um, I mean, we have kind of seen this with student loans, which have been increasing as well, right? Um, so Balmont's conclusion in this 1993 paper is basically the nature of the right choice is by no means clear, right? Like what's gonna happen with all these things is not obvious, right? Um, it's just something to think about, right? And something that's helpful to understand about like why our economy is working the way it is and why things are becoming more expensive, right? Um, what we wanna do about it is not really obvious, right? Um, it probably won't be an app. Um, I know we as a technologist tend to default towards technology to solve every single problem. Um, I would like to suggest that in this particular problem, a lot of the solutions are gonna involve politics. Um, and one interesting thing about politics is like, the value of a signal increases with how difficult it is to produce, right? So it's kind of the opposite of making one thing and having it scale to a million users, right? Like if you can get 100 people to show up at City Hall on a Tuesday night, that's a really valuable political signal, right? It's the opposite of like, doing one thing that's really cheap and having a big impact, right? Um, so it kind of runs counter to uh, what we want to do as technologists, right? So if you want to get involved with the solutions to this or whatever, 
how whatever those may look like. Um, anyway, uh, go talk to your neighbors, lobby, uh, write articles for the paper, uh, run for office, run for school board. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Okay, so how does inflation fit into all this? Yeah. Um, so inflation is generally, the question is how does inflation figure in? Um, inflation is like uh, the fact that things tend to get more expensive over time just in general. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it does kind of factor in. It's just like a, a background feature of the economy. Um, it measures like the rise in prices of everything, right? Um, so the problem is I think that the, not everything rises in price, right? Like something's decreasing price, right? Like uh, appliances, like a dishwasher is cheaper than it used to be, right? Or a car is cheaper than it used to be. Um, or we're buying like or the car is the same price, but we get more features for it, right? So like cars have airbags now and they used to not have airbags. Um, I guess the, the problem in this particular thing is that uh, these costs tend to ride faster than inflation as a whole, right? So the, the, the costs of these tend to be increasing faster than the economy is an average, right? So the share of the economy of these services is larger and larger over time, right? So uh, yes, inflation is, is an issue, but in particular, the problem is that the costs in these industries tend to be increasing faster than inflation, right? if that makes sense. That's why it's such a problem, right? If, if costs were increasing in line with inflation, it'd be like, okay, that's not that big an issue, right? It's, you know, so. Anyone else? Yeah. So I, I know you said that there aren't easy technology solutions to this problem, but like as technologists, like do you think that should guide what technologies we do work on um it's hard to say i mean yeah it can right i mean the the, the benefits bigger right if, if we're spending more, more more of our money on healthcare, it's just a bigger pot to go after right so i mean in that sense if you if you if you invent something that lowers healthcare costs by a lot you're going to have a bigger reward um you know because it is a bigger share of the economy in that sense, yeah, I mean, yeah, it does make sense. I just tend to think a lot of the solutions to these problems or solutions in these areas don't tend to be technological, right? Um, or they might be in some other, some other area, right? Or some other uh, some other vehicle for delivering them. I guess what I meant more meant is like, if you're working on something that's accelerating, like that's accelerating these trends of like, you know, super increasing productivity. And you mentioned the sort of, you know, displacing the sort of disruptive impacts that it could have, you know, on, on the workforce. Like, does that, does that, you know, do you think that should factor into your decision as a technologist as to what to work on? Uh, it's hard to say, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay, great, thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah, thank you. Sweet. Um, let's test this. Does this work? Can you hear me? Cool. Kind of? I can talk louder. So. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's do Remember that. The, the oh, yeah. Hold it like a wrapper. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. So I chose two papers. Um, and then as I was making my slides, I was like, shit, I chose two papers. So this might get like really long. Um, but I didn't want like one paper to be jealous of the other paper because papers have feelings. Um, so it's the tale of two papers. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, just like um, the book, um, mostly because both papers have to do with outages and downtimes in data centers. Um, so there is an overall arching theme here. Um, and I just like love bugs. So I asked this question on Twitter and there was like a shit ton of responses, which I will not go through, but there were some really funny ones just to go to show that like literally anything can happen when you're running code somewhere. Um, so here's one from Jace um, that was like a data link between our DR site and main site was having rhythmic packet loss like this. Ooh, X, ooh, X. Um, it was fiber and nothing could explain it except the lines had fallen from a pole accident and were lying across the road. Packet loss was cars driving over it. So yeah. Um, this one's caused by, obviously, weight, and then there is another one that was caused by weight <laughs> from James Turnbull. So, um, S390 box kept powering down, could not find a fault, everything looked totally normal, eventually sat next to the box all night to babysit it. 
Nothing happens. About 4 a.m., he gets up to get coffee, and the box powers down. So it was the loose floor tile that was wobbling the power cable. So yeah, basically anything can happen when you are doing things. Um, so who cares, right, like about all like outages and downtimes? Well, like everyone should. Um, depending on your industry, it means like various things, but retail, like loss of sales, finance, you'll not be able to trade or you won't be able to like know where the fuck the money is. Um, service companies, like you can't access the service. And then if you're a cloud provider, like minutes of the service outages cost millions of dollars. So that leads into our first paper, which is what bugs cause production cloud incidents. So this one came out of Microsoft Research and they like ended up looking at a lot of kind of the bugs in Microsoft Azure that took down all of the cloud. Um, what I actually found fascinating about this is that uh, it looked at everything but not like natural disasters, which we'll get into the second paper, but there was like this like kind of lightning storm that took out my, uh, Azure like a while ago, but it was not probably in the time frame for this. Um, so yeah, uh, let's get into it. So what caused these incidents? Um, and what they kind of did was like place bugs into categories. So um, a few were like data format bugs, um, then there were timing bugs, um, then like memory bugs and uh, bugs with variables and stuff like that. We'll get into like kind of like the exact details. Um, yeah, but they also found that like not a lot of bugs were actually caused to hardware failures, maybe because they're doing like custom hardware and stuff like that. Um, so how did they actually end up resolving the bugs? Um, so different bugs in open source software, um, production in incidents were most likely to be resolved without a code patch. So like they're not actually solving the problem. It's more like they're going to put like a bandaid on it um, for the time being. And we'll also get over kind of the details of that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting to know that like patching things, especially when you're in a rush and something's going down, it's like that's that's not actually what turns out to be the fix. So um, what they actually focused on were like a set of like 112 different incidents over this like six months period of time in 2018, which is probably why the whole lightning thing in like South America was not in here because that was like after this. Um, so what they looked at was like the incident was not a false alarm. Uh, the incident led to changes in the cloud service. So like uh, bug fixing patches, test enhancement, like they actually did stuff to prevent this in the future. Uh, the incident report contains enough information for us to judge the root cause. Um, and then the root cause of the incident is an actual software bug. Um, so yeah, and, and like not all of these incidents actually affected their customers. So what are the bugs? 21% um, were data format bugs. 31% uh, were fault related bugs. 13% uh, were timing and then 7% were like constant value bugs. And then there was like a bunch of just other kind of miscellaneous shit. So when it comes to like data format incidents, there's kind of like two ways that they categorize these. One was like a local file. So like anything with changing in a database or like a certain file, like maybe a config file um, that changed, or it was like a message interface. So like your API has changed the version, which like, I'm sure a lot of people can commiserate because that happens all the fucking time. Um, so those broke things and then it caused like data center failure. Um, and like if you're updating software, like be aware obviously that like you might change your API and then break everything else. So kind of what I like about this paper is that at the end of each of these, they have this like discussion of like, what could they do better? Or, like what could we think about in the future? So like, um, this one was uh, like kind of looking for ways to automatically find these failures in the data formats or like a change in your API or automatically like know that something changed that will break something would be really nice, especially when it comes to like code versions, there should be a way to do that. Um, so fault related incidents, um, these were a few various different things. It's like an error component, which is like a specific task or job is failing. Um, and the error can't be handled. Um, there is an unresponsive component, like a hanging job, deadlock, whatever. Um, and then there's like silent corruption. So like your data or something alongside of it 
is just not uh, behaving or returning the value that you want. Um, so those are pretty common as well. Um, so this usually isn't a problem in like just one machine. It's like more of a distributed systems problem. Um, and it's also like very kind of specific to cloud services. Um, and then, yeah. Nothing really interesting there. Timing incidents. Um, so 13% of the bugs were timing incidents and 14% uh, are a deadlock issue, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, they also looked at like race conditions and um, when it comes to like distributed data stores like Zookeeper or a database, um, you can get into a lot of these kind of like bugs um, and that, that happened to be like half of the actual timing incidents that they found. And it happens in between like nodes versus, you know, on a single machine. So it's really hard to reproduce a lot of these on a single machine. It's more like a distributed systems problem. So um, traditional timing bug techniques uh, need to be adapted to handle like the distributed systems problem and different nodes um, versus just the single, single machine problem. So then there's the constant value setting incidents. And so these were uh, problems where uh, it's like an incorrect setting of a constant, so either like a typo or something like that, um, which is, you know, crazy. You, you can actually like find a bunch of like production out incidents online where like a config just had a typo. Um, so like hard case variables, stuff like that. Um, so kind of like thinking about this one, it would be really cool if you also automatically found a fix or like generated an alert if, if one of these like typos or semantic bugs came up. So how did they resolve a lot of these? Um, so a lot of these were like uh, not mitigated by patching buggy code um, just because of like the time pressure that they were under. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of them just like in the mitigation reports later led to a software patch, but like it was not immediately patched. It was just like a band-aid. Um, so if we look at like kind of what they did was like take all this data and then they, they answered various questions on it. So the first one was, what are the common strategies for mitigating software bug incidents? Um, and then if we take a look at this chart, like 44% are just fix it. Um, and then like mitigate the code, mitigate the data and mitigate the environment. Um, Data mitigation, like you have to like manually restore, clean, and delete like either the file or whatever like is messed up. Um, so a lot of this kind of requires like manual intervention. So then what um, like are the different types of bugs resolved differently? Um, and you can kind of look at like the resolve strategy for each of these bugs and it's like pretty much uh, random. Um, <laughs> Like every single bug is like its own little like unique snowflake. Um, so yeah, which, which obviously makes this harder to automate. Um, and then do different types of incidents take different amounts of time to get resolved. Um, and it turns out like data format, fault related and timing are all kind of like simultaneously the same. Constant value seems to be harder, which is actually like, kind of interesting when it comes to the fact that like if that's a typo like really should it be that hard um but it, it might be the fact that that is like the simple fix like i i mean like as someone who has written software for a while it's like you never think of the easy thing first and then you're like fucking a i just did put the wrong string in there um so i i, I don't know i thought that was like pretty interesting because i was like wow that lines up with everything that i know about software um so yeah um so then they kind of like talk about how for Azure, they've come up with like all these tools and like cool shit for like solving all the problems. But then it turns out like it doesn't actually do its job at the end of the day. Like they have all these tools and automation, but then it's like, we still have fucking bugs. Um, they have less bugs than maybe like a normal company, but they still have a problem with bugs. Um, so they kind of like leave the reader with this hope that like, maybe you can automatically generate and fix problems in the future based off this data that they found um, and stuff like that. Uh, so it would be interesting to see like what sort of automation could be done, uh, but they don't really go over it. 
So yeah, that is the first paper, which leads us into the second paper of, I don't even know how to pronounce this, Maelstrom. Um, so yeah, um, the first paper kind of covered like software bugs in general. This covers like natural disasters because you know, that's super common as well. Um, and this came out of Facebook and I find it like fascinating because like you think it's actually like in theory, this is a simple problem. Like they're using this to, um, you know, a data center gets like hit by a hurricane or something. Right. And it's like drain all the traffic and then move it to another data center. So like in theory, that's a simple problem, but then it turns out to be like really complex. Um, and pretty cool. So first I was like, what the fuck does this word mean? Um, it turns out to mean a powerful, often violent whirlpool sucking objects in within a given radius, which I think is like kind of cool. Um, and I kind of really like the name and they never even touched on like what the name meant in the paper. And I was like, that, that would have been nice. <laughs> so internet services, you know, in distributed services, you have like a bunch of different services going on. So at this scale for Facebook, in rare natural disasters, hurricanes blowing down power lines and flooding, this occurs regularly. So I think it's like weird that they say that this occurs regularly because like, it doesn't seem like it does, but they've been using this in production for four years. So like, maybe it does occur regularly for them. Um, so yeah, man-made incidents, network fiber cuts, software bugs, misconfiguration, they attack, uh, affect the entire data center. So, uh, the basic idea of this is like you drain traffic from the data center that's affected and then you put it into another data center that's healthy. Um, and yeah, so like in theory, it's simple. It turns out to be like really, really hard because like disasters trigger failures that affect like multiple interdependent systems simultaneously. So like in your distributed system, like this service talks to this service talks to this service talks to this service, and then they're interdependent to each other. It's almost like the dependencies of your software code, except for all these services have dependencies of their own. So you have to like keep in mind that like, if you move one service, all its child dependent services also need to be moved. And then you're doing this at a scale of a company that has like so many microservices, right, that like your ops team doesn't know like what services depend on each other. So you kind of need to automate this, right? So yeah, basically this is saying that the hardest part of this is like the dependency management, which like the hardest part of any software code base is dependency management as well. Um, so it's kind of a very mirrored approach. Uh, so some services also require this like custom mitigation where like you need the specific load balancer to also move with the service. Um, everything at the end of the day, we know is like some sort of unique snowflake, nothing simple. Um, it's hard to actually like do this in a way that like can be done for 100% of the services, like maybe 90% and then 10% are gonna be these unique situations. Um, and then if you end up messing up this, of course, like dependency chain of services, then you're gonna have another cascading failure in your new data center that you're, is, was healthy, right? So it's like, you wanna move shit, but then also not break more shit as you're moving shit. So yeah, it turns out to be super hard. So there's like various types of traffic that they account for. So stateless traffic is just like the majority of like their web service traffic, which is like super easy to deal with. Sticky traffic is like, it's pinned to specific machines, maintaining like the state of that service or whatever. So incoming like session requests need to be rerouted and then established and then torn down. So there's that. Then there's replication traffic. Rerouting typically requires like configuration changes or other heavyweight changes. And then there's stateful traffic, hot standbys, which is like typically requires promoting a secondary to become the new master. So state may need to be copied from that one data center to another. Um, so you have to account for all these various things and then people kind of need to like tag their service or whatever as like behaving this certain way. So how they end up solving this is that there's like run books. So every single like service has a run book and it's like a very specific set of tasks for that service that needs to be done if you're gonna migrate it. And you can kind of imagine that like this shit needs to be up to date for the service. So like, if this is not up to date, like the second 
that the system automatically tries to like migrate the service. It's like, oh, well, like two weeks ago, we added this other task and it's not in there. Um, and then of course you're, you've got cascading failures and more problems. So yeah, um, it, it, it ends up being quite complicated with like very numerous different specific tasks um, for each like service that they're running. Um, and this is basically saying that they need to be up to date or else it's going to break. And then what they do to actually test this is like draining things every so often. Um, and it's like an automated test to make sure that these runbooks are up to date uh, to drain things and move them to another data center. So this is kind of what like a runbook looks like to drain a messaging services sticky traffic. So um, you have your preconditions and then you redirect all your new sessions and there's health checks in between. And then there's like post conditions, then preconditions, and then you have to tear down all the existing sessions. So like, if you think about this at a scale of like a hundred or like 200 different services, it's, it gets like super complicated. Um, and then there's various types of dependencies that you need to like think about also for each service. Um, so there's the bootstrapping dependencies that happen when a service depends on other components to like start the service. Um, and then there's RPC dependencies, which uh, if a service requires RPCs um, from other services. And then state dependencies, which uh, could be like sessions or traffic. So you also have to like identify all your dependency chains for your service, which also needs to be up to date. So um, kind of ends up looking like this where like the services rely on each other. And then in your dependency graph, like, of course it could be really fucking complicated. And then I'm sure that they run into, obviously they didn't mention this, but I feel like the diamond dependency problem as well, where like there's a chicken and egg problem between the services, which would be absolutely insane. So um, there's like a lot more charts in the paper when it comes to like actually like looking at how they drain and restore traffic. Um, but I thought this one was interesting. So this is like the time of draining the nodes and then restoring it. And you can see how kind of the traffic moves. Um, and it's pretty interesting. They have like since they've been doing this for four years with numerous production systems, like 100 plus, um, it's pretty cool that like Instagram and Facebook can handle moving to an entire data center automatically. And then uh, this is what like the network utilization looks like in various data centers um, when the data center is being drained and restored, which is kind of really cool. So what they learned was that like these drain tests help them understand the interactions between the systems in their uh, code base, uh, because otherwise like no one can really like wrap their head around like obviously all of Facebook's infrastructure and services anymore. Like there's, it, it's just way too complex. Um, and then the drain tests help them prepare for disaster and the drain tests are challenging to run. And then uh, automating disaster mitigation completely, it's not a goal. Like. Uh, at some point there has to be like some sort of human or manual interaction. Um, it, it, they just like could not completely automate it. Um, and then building the right abstractions to handle the failures is like super important. Um, the run books and the tasks um, allows like the team to own their service and their policies for moving that service, um, which is really good, but they also need to be kept up to date. Um, or else it will fail, but that's how, where the drain tests come in. So um, they learned like over time that like as their infrastructure becomes more complicated, then uh, it's critical to develop trusted tools and mechanisms to prepare for and respond to failure. Um, so like Maelstrom, you know, solved all these problems for them, which is great, uh, but they also uh, Propose drain tests as a new testing strategy to identify dependencies amongst the server and ensure that like tools and procedures for uh, handling the failures are always up to date. So the overall theme of this talk basically in the two papers is shit happens, it best to be prepared. Um, and if you're running at the scale of Facebook, honestly, like what they built seems super cool. So I'd be interested in 
hearing if anyone has done something similar. And that's all. Questions? Questions, not comments. So I didn't have a chance I didn't have a chance to read the second paper, read the first one. Did they, in the second paper, discuss doing a similar draining, restarting for a single service? Like I thought last year, Amazon S3 went down, and, and if you read the description, it, had, it was a kind of a similar thing. They had backflow, back pressures, and things had to be drained. And did they discuss applying principles to an individual global service? So yeah, I think they do it per service, the tests. I, I wouldn't imagine that they do it um, all at the same time, because that sounds terrifying, yeah. Uh, so like um, there's this chaos engineering subfield of like and lineage driven fault injection and all these things like introduce problems in a infrastructure to try to like tease this stuff out in your opinion and like maybe also based on your like consulting experience is are these things really effective or do they require like a certain amount of infrastructure in place already to really like get any value? Um, as far as I've seen, no one's doing that in production. Like, and if they're doing it, it's not, it's, it's more like by accident. Um, <laughs> like, like most people have so many problems that like even thinking about chaos engineering is not what they're thinking about. It's like, well, we have to actually like fuck the, like fix this like uh, CI, you know? Like you have bigger problems than like actually breaking things for fun and then things break by accident anyway, so you have to fix that. I honestly like haven't seen any company mostly other outside of Netflix, like doing that. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Anyone else? Um, in the first paper, it seems to me that uh, this is going to turn into a question. Um, that uh, <laughs> sorry, I can see Elaine about to start me. Um, uh, <laughs> um, that the kinds of incident and the mitigations might change per the kind of system you're working on. So if you've got a zookeeper where strong consistency is kind of super important, the mitigation is probably not delete the data, but you said that was super effective. Do they speak to that at all? Do you have any opinions on that? So they like tried, I mean, in one of these charts, they, they tried to show like the mitigations for each one. And it, it really was random, but no, I, I totally agree with you in that like for things that are like data specific, I think it's because they put the data for uh, like network APIs and then also local files. So then it ended up looking like, they're all kind of the same. I mean, like, minus like constant value doesn't have like mitigate in, um, and then data format doesn't have mitigate in. Um, but yeah, they they like tried to do that kind of similarity, and then this is what they came up with. Uh, yeah. For the second paper, uh, the run books, did it go into any details around like like how would you actually? Is it just like a shell script or like like how does that actually work? Yeah, more um, shell scripts somewhere between. I think that like one of the tasks can be a shell script, um, or multiple tasks will be like a shell script at the end of the day. But like then it's like you need to put them into this like UI. I mean, they go over all of it in detail, um, but you need to put like all your kind of tasks into a UI, and it could be anything. Is there another one over here? From the graphs, it looks like the draining took about a half hour or so idea why it would take that long or is it dns caching or any idea what's going on there uh i honestly don't remember and it might have just been that one graph like it might just be yeah um, this is not related to the papers but i was wondering if you could say more about building a nuclear reactor <laughs> right <laughs> 
I might like then be arrested, you know. <laughs> I get a question about the time because the time over here is pretty long. Uh, do they cover anything about like incidents that are like really quick? Because you know, hurricane you can probably predict like it will hit the data center in X amount of hours, but for example, I don't know, huge earthquake or something that is like instantly happening and you cannot, uh, you don't have a time to prepare. Yeah, so um, in some of these, like they did have the time to prepare and they go over it, um, but yeah, they go over time in detail. Um, and, and, and it seems to like depend on the actual incident that's in progress. Yeah. Oh no, totally. Like if if it like a network <laughs> connection is gone, you're like then screwed. Anyone else? Hey, um, did you get any sense for um, how they're actually managing multiple versions of multiple services that exist, perhaps even in this one data center, or if they have any kind of deployments um, for handling, you know, like a canary deployment and, you know, one service in one data center? How are they managing, you know, you have multiple versions of multiple dependencies even um, between those things. Do they talk about how well this is integrated into their kind of release process at all, or did you get a sense of that? Um Honestly, I didn't, um, but I, I would assume it falls under that same dependency, kind of uh, the way that they define that. I don't know. Thanks. Did the paper mention at all if any of this kind of exploration has actually influenced the design of systems in the future in order to make them easier to kind of create run books for or like has it has it made them rethink how they design their microsystem service dependencies at all? Uh, they did not mention that, but that would be interesting actually. Cool. I think we should go to the bar now. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jesse.